That looks live to me, Andy. Um, yep, go for it. Brilliant. No, that's fabulous. Well, welcome, everybody. Um, and again, new session. Um, I can't really say an awful lot about this. I was going to come up, try and come up with some um, some fancy introduction to this, but it's it's completely new to me. I'm I'm very excited to be here to to listen, and I hope everybody else is. Um, we've got a fabulous turnout already, over 250 participants, and um, a slightly different format with the Q and A's through the through the session. So, um, without further ado, I think we'll um, we'll hand over to Greg and his panelists and. Um, yeah, let's uh, learn a little bit more about the introduction to glider GPS triangular racing, or triangle racing, I should say. Thank you, Mark. Well, good evening to everybody. Um, fantastic turnout. And I know talking to my various friends in different disciplines of model flying, that we've got some control line flyers, we've got some aerobatic pilots, 3D helicopters. So um, and we might even, uh, hopefully, amongst that 264 people who've got participants, have some glider pilots as well. So it's a great, great turnout. And uh, thank you very much. Um, as both Andy and Mark said, um, and John and I were talking about, the, uh, the John Greenford and I were talking about some of the best presentations that John's done at club nights, um, really it's on how you guys interact with us and the questions you ask us and how much you uh, can sort of extract from us. And we've got some fantastic experts on, on the panel tonight. We've got Simon, who's, um, well, sort of his record in competition flying uh, speaks for itself. We've got Bernie and Andre, who are the experts on the electronic side of it, the GPS and the, the app. And we've got John Greenfield, who um, has probably been the, the early adopter of GPS flying in the UK and uh, flies at an incredibly high level and achieved a podium uh, in the World Masters a few, few years ago. So we've got a really super packed panel. So please ask your questions. Um, you know, mine as much information as you can from us. And the, the presentation there is just to really to provoke some areas of, of debate. So, uh, uh, you know, we'll, we'll move through that. <clears throat> so um, one of the things that I get asked, asked quite a bit when I'm flying, both power flying and glider flying, is people say to me, oh, my, um, my flying sort of stagnated. And I said, well, have you, have you considered doing an A test or a B test or flying in some competitions? And quite often people don't quite like that. They feel they're pressurized. Uh, and they don't want to don't enter competitions or they don't, they don't want to do an A or a B test. Um, so one of the things that you might really find that's good about GPS triangle racing is as we go through it, is that you'll see that when you actually go to the field, if you're doing this, it gives you a structure to your flying. It gives you a, an objective every time that you go flying uh, to do something. And maybe one of the things that's good about doing an A certificate or a B certificate or flying in competitions and doing aerobatics is that you have a schedule to fly to and you end up flying the plane rather than the, the plane flying you. And I often say that to people when, when they're flying, do you feel the plane's flying you or are you flying the plane? So as we move on and we go through what it's all about and what the task is and how it works, you perhaps see that it's something that you can go to the field every, every time you fly your glider and um, actually have a real structure to what you're doing. And you'll soon set a personal best when you're doing it. And it's a bit like golf, uh, if any of you play golf. Um, it, you, will, you will want to beat that every time that you, you go out and fly. So let's just look at the agenda. We're going to very quickly talk about the history. Um, and anyone who knows anything about full-size gliding will know that they, they do task flying. So they do goal and return, triangle flying, etc. cetera. Um, once, once you sort of get through the beginning stage and you can actually fly solo, most glider pilots move very quickly on to task flying. Um, then we'll talk about the three classes that are available to you if you want to have a go at it. And then we've got Andre, who um, has really come onto the, the scene with GPS triangle racing the last few years and, and grabbed hold of the technology and turned it into a very viable and cost effective uh, product, which is it's super reliable now. And, and, and also the miniaturization of it is fantastic. And then we'll talk about getting started. And again, you know, these are areas um, getting started. These are where we'd really expect you to, to ask us some good questions and difficult questions about the best way of doing it. And then we'll talk a little bit about something that's fairly unique to, to, to model flying. Um, but it sort of goes back to when the um, gliding first, thermal soaring first started in the UK. And Simon will nod his head when I say this, is that they, we used to run a lot of postal competitions. So you used to fly and post your event, your uh, competition results in. And you could fly anywhere in the country against each other at the same time on the same day. And... Um, you could, you could do that and we, we, you wouldn't have to drive hundreds of miles. And of course, obviously with the internet, 
technologies move forward. And one of the really nice things about GPS triangle racing is you can fly and you can post your flight if you want to up onto the onto the GPS league, which is a worldwide thing. And you can fly against people from all over the world and compete against them. And so for me this year, one of the really good things about it is I haven't been able to do my competition flying, but what I have been able to do is compete against people from Tenerife and from, from Germany and from Australia it, uh, on a daily basis. And it's been absolutely fascinating. So we'll talk a little bit about that as well. So um, let's sort of move on. Um, GPS triangle racing sort of really came out of uh, these large scale models, which they've been around. And uh, it's funny, on the attendees list, we've got someone, I think it's Chris, who's been flying large scale models in the UK for many, many years. Um, and, you know, it, they are so inspirational or aspirational to own. They look beautiful, they're fantastic in the sky, they've got a wow factor. Um, one of the problems with them is that they're designed to do two things really well, which is to fly fairly quickly with an incredible glide angle and to thermal soar. And beyond that, they don't really do much else. If you try and do aerobatics with them, you can just see from the size of them and the aspect ratio that they're not going to be particularly great at aerobatics. So if you, um, done you a few low passes and beat ups and loops and wowed the crowd, um, beyond that, they're sort of, they're quite an expensive plane to own. And they very much are, it's an objet d'art sort of thing, which is just got a fantastic pride of ownership. But as I say, a lot of people that bought large scale aeroplanes um, after, after a while, they, um, Think, well, what am I going to do with this? And they don't actually tend to fly it very much. So, sort of about sort of 10 years ago, uh, 11 years ago, in sort of Germany and Switzerland and Austria, they, they had this thought and they thought, well, actually, why don't we try to emulate what a full size glider does, which is to fly a task? And you, we've already mentioned that it could be a goal and return task or it could be a triangle task. And if you think about the constraints of model flying and visibility, a triangular task is the natural way to go. And the natural way to maybe monitor where your plane is, is to use GPS technology so that you can actually see where the plane is in the sky and fly it around that, that course. So it sort of grew and it especially grew for the, the large gliders. And then, as I said earlier, uh, John Greenfield took on scale flying and it'd be interesting to talk to, to John later. I'd like to ask him some questions about, in fact, he was a power flyer and he made the transition into flying gliders and how he actually uh, did that and become, become an exceptionally, in fact, world-class uh, GPS triangle racing pilot, which is often not the case when you have a pi power pilot that becomes a glider pilot. But often glider pilots become very good power flyers, but it's, it's quite rare for it to go the other way. So uh, I, like, I would like some commentary from John later, actually, about how he managed to do that. So as I said, these planes, totally aspirational, beautiful planes to own, uh, very, very evocative. Um, but what do you do with them? And, and you, you know, I think the idea was to do some task flying. So let's look at the task. So very, very simple. You've got a triangular course and you have a start finish line. If anyone's done any sailing, that's, that's like an imaginary start line, sailboat start line. And you cross the start line going in the direction of flight from left to right. So if this was a map, that would be from west to east. And you can fly down and go around the first turn sector and then up to turn sector two and turn sector three. Now you don't actually actually have to fly outside the triangle. You can fly anywhere within the triangle as long as you fly through those green sector turn points. So, and the reason for that is there may be fantastic lift in the middle of the course, or there may be fantastic lift out to the right of the course and you go and do some flying and gain some, some altitude. Um, and in, in the scale class, which we'll talk about in a moment, um, there are two parts to it in the competition. There are how many laps you can do in 30 minutes, and they also have a speed task, which is how fast you can go around that course from your launch height. There's a set launch height, we'll talk about that as well in a minute, um, and dive down in one lap and, and see how quickly you can go over one lap. So if I move on and we'll look at the scale class firstly. Oh, actually, I'll, I'll talk about this. So that is that is the, if you like, the, the theoretical point of it now actually that's what sort of output of the gps triangle data would look like onto the app that andre will talk about later so you can see um, that you've got the triangle there um, this is a north south orientation so the course is orientated northwest southeast and you can see even with fairly accurate tight flying you're never going to fly a perfect triangle 
And very quickly, when you look at that, you can see by the curves in the lines that the wind was blowing from the southwest at the time. But what we'll do is we'll go through this presentation and you'll see how you go from the theory of it to the reality of being able to, to do what we've got there on that slide. So if we look at the scale class, you've got this start line. And when you're standing there on that yellow line, looking out to the north to that second turn point, you've got a turn point, which is 500 meters to the left of you, 500 meters to the right of you. And the apex of the triangle is 500 meters away along that start finish line. So the two other legs aren't 500 meters, they're a different distance. And when you add it all up, it comes to 2.4 kilometers. So that's a fairly big course and you need a fairly big plane to fly that. Um, start height for the, the scale class is 500 meters and you have a maximum flight speed that you can cross the flight line of 120 kilometers an hour. And if you go over the start line higher than 500 meters or faster than 120 kilometers an hour, you will get a start penalty, which will be deducted off your score. So you would probably go, if you did that, we'd go back and restart and get yourself below those two, two variables before you, you, you did that. Okay, so types of planes that fly in it, there, there are two categories within the scale class. There's gliders that are aero-towed and there are gliders that are called SLS, and these are self-launching gliders, and they all fly under the, the same rules. So you can imagine from a pilot's perspective, if you've only got a aero-tow type glider, you need someone like Simon Thornton, who's happy to come along and, and aero-tow you with his tug, uh, and you can't fly on your own if you've got no tug pilot. So this is where the, the SLS class came along, and they're self-launching and the motor pop, pops back down. So very, quite a popular class in Europe. I think literally in the UK, there's a handful of guys that've got planes that fly, fly the, like this. Um, and if you look on the, on the, the GPS league, uh, the net league that we're gonna talk about at the end, but about John is about the only pilot in the UK that posts scores for the scale class. Okay, let's move on. So let's move on to the next class that came along, which was the sports class. And the idea of the sports class, I think was to appeal to the European flyer that's got have planes that are probably over four meters and up to five meters. So if we think about iconic planes, the multiplex or now tangent Alpina would have been a plane that would have been into this uh, category. And, and in Europe, again, because they tend to, when they slope soar, they tend to fly on high Alps with very little wind. They tend to be electric launch planes, but they've got the size um, that when you're flying on a, a very large mountain, they, they're, eight, they're sort of, they, they impose themselves on, 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 on the flying and the, and the mountain, whereas the types of planes that maybe we fly in slopes are in the UK, because we have a different type of hill, we tend to fly on, on our sort of downlands. Um, our models are normally two to two and a half metres, and we tend to fly a lot of aerobatic aeroplanes, whereas the Europeans tend to fly these sports, more semi-scale looking aeroplanes. So again, the course is slightly smaller, so 350 metres on either side of the start line, 350 metres out to the, the triangle from, as a straight line. So again, the, the two, two other legs are slightly longer than 350 meters and the maximum course, course length is 1.7 kilometers. Um, slightly lower start height, but the same start speed. And as with the, the scale class, you have 30 minutes to, to fly the task out. And um, with both classes, both scale and the sports, if you launch to 400 meters, and there's no lift, absolutely still air, you will not fly 30 minutes. You might fly eight or nine or 10 minutes before you land. So to fly that 30 minutes out, you'll definitely have to encounter, find some lift and climb up and use the lift to, to maintain your height. And then this is where the tactics come in, where it becomes like full-size gliding. You have to make a decision about, do you stay in the thermal or do you actually crack on and go around the course? Which is exactly what you see full-size pilots do. They, they get under a cloud street, and they'll fly along, they'll circle a bit under the thermal, they'll fly on a bit, get, get up to 200 kilometers an hour. Um, and they're all the time making an evaluation about how far they've got to go and how much height they've got and, and minimum sink, whether they've got enough height to make it to the end of the task. So these are all the same decision-making processes that you have with this class, which is one of the things that makes it very, very exciting. Um, so this, these are sort of typical planes. Um, that are, an Alpina there, 
about his Skywalker and John with a very patriotic um, chili, chili from Valenta or GPS special um, at his field at the, at the Phoenix there. So um, but those are the sort of typical planes. Again, very attractive, very nice um, aspirational planes to own. Um, and there are, you know, there are a good number of these planes in the UK at the moment where I would say people are flying them off the flat field or flying them off the slope. But very quickly, they with the equipment in could be, be you could be doing some GPS triangle racing with them and having a go with it. And we'll talk a little bit about this later whether or not you know obviously the scale class the rules are very defined. But in this class, you don't have to have a perfect world championship winning plane to have a go at this and and enjoy it. It's um it, you know if you, you, you can have a plane that you could compete in the sports class and it could be a four meter plane it doesn't have to be a five meter plane and simon might talk a little bit about the plane that he owns which i would say if you were buying a plane to win the world championships you might not choose your plane simon but it it's a plane that's pretty competitive for gps triangle racing yeah it's probably a little bit on the small side yeah yeah so um i suppose a few years ago f5j really started to take off um uh, it's the FAI really wanted to bring all the thermal soaring classes together that are around different European countries and the States and Australia. And so the FIJ rules really settled down, I suppose, with it, the other type of thermal soaring that everyone was doing, which was a tow line or winch based thermal soaring. That was becoming increasingly difficult to do because you need a team of towers to get you airborne. And quite often you had two people towing with a pulley and it was becoming quite a sort of technological Thing to do and also you needed people who were really good runners as well who were quite strong to, to do the towing so the electrification of thermal soars in the f5j class has seen a lot of people buy uh, thermal soaring models f5j type models in in the uk and and across the world and the guys that run the gps triangle league thought well you've got all these planes out there hundreds of planes in fact it's very very popular is um why don't we tr come up with a gps class where people can multi-step purpose or do two types of activity with one aeroplane and that they'll be really competitive so if you have an f5j thermal soarer uh, you can fly it in what's called the gps light class and it's much smaller triangle um, low, much lower start height only 200 meters and the class has got a maximum flight height of 350 meters so if you fly over 350 meters you get a zero you get no score um, and the idea was that people could say take their FIJ model and um, rather than just perhaps make perhaps maybe practice FIJ and thermal soaring. And, and those planes are so efficient at thermal soaring now. They've got wing loadings of somewhere around four and a half ounces per square foot. Um, that the reality is on a, a really warm day in the UK, where maybe we don't even get quite as good lift as they get in some of the warmer countries in Europe. There's no reason why you can't fly, fly a plane like that literally all day without landing because they were just so efficient at thermal soaring um, so to use those planes in this gpi gps light class so similar similar thing counterclockwise course 200 meters either start to the start line 200 meters to the apex of the triangle just under a kilometer and a much shorter task time so 20 minutes and it's been quite a success i would say in europe this this year in well, 2020 in terms of the uh, number of people participating in it and if you looked on the, the gps league you can see that probably it's got the highest number of participants of the three leagues the scale the, the sport and, and the light class um, but again you know if you've got a thermal sora you can even put some gps kit in um, a multiplex easy glider or radian and, and have a go at this um, if you wanted to if you've got the the technology you don't have to fly a 200 meter course if you were learning to do this you can actually program a shorter course into the app and we can talk a little bit uh, about that later on so this this course is or class is very much designed to get people into gps triangle racing using a plane they probably got already okay and there's some pictures of the typical sorts of plane that people are using in in gps light now maximum wingspan four meters. There is a maximum loading, which is 30 grams per square decimeter of the surface area of the plane. So that's the wing, the top of the fuselage and the tail plane. Um, the idea is that they wanted to keep this class to, the, to these F5J thermal soaring type models rather than having F3B type planes that are much heavier loaded and um, probably more expensive or more, more exotic to, to buy. 
Um, FIJ planes at the top end are obviously fairly rarefied as well, but it, I think they felt there were more planes that could be dual purpose than, that, than if they'd made the wing loading heavier. So that's the three classes. I'll just stop at this point and say, have we got any questions that are on the list or people have asked that um, maybe we could open up to the panel of experts? Yeah, I can, well, I can, I'll read a couple out to you. We've got um, Andrew Ellison. Um, we all know Andy. Um, how many pilots on course at the same time in the UK, question mark, in international events? Okay. John, John can, is, John's been to an international event, so he can answer that. Um, I'll pick up on that one. Um, it depends how many entries there are. Um, if you're flying in competition, there's, uh, assuming the number is less than 22, you're divided into two heats, or, or the A group and the B group. If it's more than 22, then there'd be a C group as well. So the maximum that there could ever be would be 11. But it very rarely happens that there's that many. Perfect. Thank you. Um, Joe Harvey asked a question, which I think you're probably going to cover later, but let's let's bring it in now. Is the course marked out on the ground or are you watching on a computer live? How do you know you're making the distance whilst flying? I'm, I'm guessing, Greg, you're going to cover that in a little while. And they're absolutely brilliant questions. Yep. And um, he's not, he's not, uh, he wasn't primed to ask those questions. So thank you very much for them. We've got some great, <laughs> great stuff on that in a minute with the slides. Um, but, uh, to, to sort of just build on what, what uh, John said on that, one of the beauties, of, again, about the GPS league, the net league, is, of course, you can compete on your own. You can just go and fly on the field on your own and fly and, and download the score at the end of the day. Um, and uh, it's all real time. So actually you can download your flights. And if other people are flying that day and downloading flights, you can literally look on your phone and see what the other scores are and where you are on that, on that day score. So it can be one pilot flying against, actually you can have 30, 40 people flying that weekend on that day around Europe and, and the world. Or as John says, you can go to a proper competition and you'll be in slots um, up to 11 pilots. So it, it can be one up to 11, uh, to, uh, depending on how you do it. Uh, Greg, I ought to just say at this point, um, there's basically two different types of GPS flying. There's um, the head-to-head -head competition where you'll go to a venue uh, and actually all compete, where there's fixed times, uh, slots for each, uh, each takeoff and each task. Uh, and then you say you're divided into an A group and a B group. And, and that's a head-to-head -head, um, traditional competition. Um, but there's also the league, and I know we're going to talk a little bit more about the league later on, where you can basically go to the field fly on your own uh, and using the league, see how you're doing relative to other people and how you're doing against your own previous bests. So it, it's not just something that you've got to go somewhere to take part in a competition with other people at the same time. In, in fact, in, in the UK, there's very few at the moment uh, competitions uh, because most people enjoy flying on the league uh, when they can do the flying when they want at their own time at their own feet. Mark, uh, Mike asked, sorry, didn't, he didn't make a note. What was the maximum wing load in for the light class? I think you may have said that. 30 grams per square decimeter for the surface area of the plane. Brilliant, thank you. And I, I would just make the point there, if you're looking to get into the, the class, it's a good question. Um, you don't, if you're not sure about it, um, you don't have to fly within the strictures of any of the classes. You could buy, you can have a glider that could be 35 grams per square decimeter, uh, an F3B plane that you might have electrified, for instance. Um, and you can fly that, you can do scores. If you download them onto the, the league, obviously you're probably not in the spirit of the league because you're flying a plane that's heavier, but there's nothing to stop you taking the existing plane that you have and, and getting into it and seeing if you like it. And then if it's something you really like, then you might consider buying something that is compliant with, with the league rules if you wanted to do that. So I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't get too hung up on the weight unless you really, really want to have a go at the, the GPS league. It's probably worth saying as well, Greg, that um, <clears throat> I mean, the, the, the tools for the job, the, um, the electric electronics, you can program any length of course you mm. want. So if you're on a small field with, let's say, a, a Radian or a Solius or something like that, you can program a smaller triangle with a lower start height 
and you can just practice the flying, flying the task. Uh, you don't have to do the traditional um, standard rules uh, triangles. Um, yeah. It's quite challenging enough just, just doing, doing the simple stuff. Yeah. And a lot of people practice when they first get the GPS triangle um, equipment and will answer uh, the question about the graphics and what you see. And there's, there's lots of sounds. There's a lot of data. One of the really exciting things about GPS triangle flying is uh, you're, it is like having all the telemetry that you'd have in a full size glider. You've got a vario, you've got your rate of sink and climb. It's, it's really up to you as a pilot about how much information you can absorb when you're flying. Um, but a lot of people, when they first do it, they go to the slope and they set up a fairly small course, a 50 or meter triangle and they fly on the slope and it gives them the opportunity to hear the sounds and the tones and work with the the visual display that you get uh, before they go and have a go on the flat field so um it's yeah it's a really good question that one earlier and we'll, we'll we will move on to it it's very very pertinent another one greg to add to that yeah. alex has asked um how do you decide decide the layout of the course is the baseline always west east so you again you might want to just add something to that as well Okay. Um, well, I, I, I'll I'll take my per, personal view on that, um, and you know the other guys can take a view. I mean, the first thing is you really, if you think about your transits along the course, you want to try to get a course where you haven't got sun in your eyes. Um, and so I try to set my course up almost northwest, west northwest for turn three, and east southeast for for turn number two. So I got my the most of the day the sun is tracking around the back of me so that i can fly like that now of course one of the problems with that is that's fine if you've got a field that you can do that in people may not ha have uh, you know they may have a row of trees at the back of them so they've got to face west or whatever um but if you've got the perfect world you're in a massive big field and you can fly in any direction it's better to, to try to get the sun out of the course when you're flying it i would add greg that um you basically can decide um, what direction you want to lay the course out. So you can tailor it exactly to the field you fly from. Obviously, the sun is a, is a valid issue, but more importantly, you may have no fly zones at your club field or um, a tree line or something else. So as you're um, building the course, which you do inside the Albatross app, and we'll come on to that later on, uh, basically you can fix the orientation uh, to anything you want it to be. Yeah, that's a good point. And also, there are certain wind directions on the course, which will make the course easier and more difficult to fly. So, again, in a perfect world, if you're flying in a, in a huge field and you can spin the course around, it's, that it's possible to, on, a, on the day to set the course to give you the optimum conditions, if you like, for, for legs. But as there, there are like the guys in Tenerife, they fly on a big plateau that's three or 450, 450 metres up. They say there's no slope width there. That the thermals bowl up the slope. They can only fly with one orientation, of course, on that on that 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 site. So Greg, that's, Greg on. sorry, just just one final one on that. Just because I'm I'm just monitoring a question here. Yeah. Oscar asks on the same thing. Can it be done on a slope? Well, yes, of course it can be done on the slope. But the actual rules of the the league itself is that it must be a flat field site with no influence of slope lift. But you can practice on a slope, and it's great to. Um, to practice on the slope to listen to the and see the telemetry that you're using the point I made earlier, but you know the 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 spirit of the spirit of the the the, the league the, the internet league if you like is that we all fly on a flat field and there's no influence of slope lift and you have to take everyone's honesty that that's that's what's happening. Um, so if we talk about how it all works, what's the heart of it all? Um, I, I'll do a little bit of a. A, a brief talk about it and then maybe Andre might want to to talk about it because a little bit as well because it, this is very much uh, work, his work um, and it's very very impressive um, so up to a, a few years ago um, there were some various bits of technology and I, I suppose you could use the word they were garage technologies they were done by hobbyists who had an interest in this and they were literally taking components from different places and, and putting it all together and making it work. And then Andre came along with up his company, RC Electronics. And we got some, Simon's done, Thornton's done some fantastic work with diagrams of all the possible different layouts. But one of the things for me when I first started it was just to know what you basically needed to get yourself going. And there are two, two sides to it. There's either the airborne side of it where you've got a transceiver. It's receiving a GPS signal into the plane. And it's transmitting data back down to the ground 
from the data that's coming out of the GPS. And if you look at the Raven there, you can see there's some little tube sticking out of it. Um, on the Sparrow, it's done electronically. You've got things like airspeed and a, a Vario uh, input to it. And that those, those um, pipes, if you like, are for something called a a dynamic vario which is something where you plug this in and you have a pitot tube on the on the plane and it um, smooths out the energy compensation of, of you flying so even if you're pulling up but you're not in lift the vario will tell you you're going down and vice versa if you're pushing down but the plane's actually climbing because it's in strong lift the vario will, will work out the energy compensation and tell you that so there's a there's a fantastic amount of data coming out of these two devices um, and typically, if you're flying the scale class, and we'll show you some photos, the Raven would be the, def the, the definitive model to go for. But most people who are flying GPS Lite um, or the um, sports class have settled on the Sparrow. It's a very, very good piece of technology. Um, and then on the ground, to receive all your data, you're going to need some form of receiver. And you can either have a snipe, which is the unit on the top left, or the Finch RF, and the Snipe is, I suppose, the Rolls-Royce. Um, it's got all the functionality and gives you all the data that comes out of it, uh, the, the, the transceiver. Or you can have a Finch RF, which is a pared down, much lower cost version of the, of the Snipe. Uh, and you lose, because of that, you lose some functionality. So one of the things that the Snipe does, um, to, answer, to start to answer the question about what you get on the ground, is that you get stereo sound coming back of where the plane is, the vario sound. And depending if you're left or right of the line that you want to be flying on to keep yourself on the course, the sound will come out of your left ear or your right ear. So you steer towards the sound that's in your headphones. Um, and then when you're flying in exactly the right place, you get the stereo sound again. So the Snipe does that, whereas the Finch RF doesn't. Now, just recently, I if you look at the two units there, the Finch is obviously a lot smaller, the, the Snipe, it's not like there in the picture, it's got a whip aerial, but I've tried the Finch RF in a, in a sports class plane uh, with a new app that Andre's just released a little while ago. And it's um, a fantastic piece of equipment, works really well. And if someone wanted to get into GPS triangle racing, a Finch in a, a Sparrow would give you pretty much everything you, you, that you would want. So some of the questions that might come up later is how much would this cost me to get into it? We have a question from Ian Medley-Rose. Uh, he's got his hand up, so I shall allow him to speak. Ian, fire away. Ian, you'll have to unmute yourself. Hi, Greg. Hello. Um, hello. Um, so um, one of the questions is probably uh, a bit deeper than you were expecting to go. So with the tech sensor, um, when you're in the climb um, under motor, um, at the start point before you actually enter the course mm -hmm. it's obviously a good idea to sniff around for a bit of lift yeah um does the tech sensor get affected by the motor run like a pito head or is the tech sensor benign to that prop draft it's benign so I, well my experience is so when you're climbing under power if you encounter lift with the tech you're using the, the dynamic vario um, you know, obviously it depends on the, your, your power setup that you have on a plane and your climb rate. Um, but even if you've got a fairly powerful plane, you're climbing, you will hear the tone and speed of the climb. If you encounter some lift, the Vario will increase in, in its tone. I, I've never had an experience with, uh, with it so far where any of the propellers affected its ability to perform. Perfect. Okay. So it, it, it just, obviously uh, you and I have been talking about this for months and um, I, I just sort of think, because one of the benefits of that taking a slow climb is that you can position yourself across the course as you're climbing. Um, and if the Vario is working as you're climbing, it means that you can spot some lift mm. and decide whether or not you start or whether you linger and wait for the lift to blow back onto the course to mm. get some benefit. Yeah. And John and John will talk. I mean, we can maybe talk, have a more in-depth conversation in the second part, the yeah, questions and answers. But John very much is a believer about um, certain power setups and your ability to do that and everything. So it's a great question. Thank you. Um, so Thank you. that's the basic technology. As I say, if people are, um, want to contact us after the presentation or we, uh, we go on to a round two of this, and um, we want to go into more in depth. And Simon's done some tremendous work on more detailed work on what this is, all, all the different setups, and we, we can show you that. So um, We do but, have a couple more hands up. Uh, oh, so we've got a question from Mark Armstrong. You can unmute yourself now. 
Can you unmute, Mark? No, it's not listening. Right, we'll go to Neil White then. Uh, yeah, can you hear me okay? Yeah, we can hear you, Neil. Well, um, the, um, the technology in the Sparrow that obviously gives you your vario and your altitude, there are various from because I fly Spectrum, so obviously a lot of the new from receivers now have vario and altitude already in them. Right? Does that work against the equipment from and for this particular application? Well, so you you if you want to re fly, record a score and produce a file, which is called an IGC file, which is the international gliding file, and download a score to the to the league, you need to use the Albatross app, which I'll we'll move on to in a minute. So the the data that comes out of the sparrow down into the snipe or finch produces that file in, in, in the app on the phone that you're, or tablet you're using. So if you've got Jetty or Spectrum or whatever, that there, there's, there's data coming from that, 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 that won't liaise, if you like, with the, the Albatross app. So it's, it's, of, it's of no use if you want to, to, to sort of fly and produce a proper formatted file that's downloadable to the league. Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. That, I think that answers my question. So, I mean, running the course, then it would probably be better to disable the vario and the altitude mm. from an in the receiver yeah. right, and run direct off the sparrow, because yeah. otherwise you'd get two lots of information. They could be fighting each other. It, well, you, it, you you'll be fighting you in your brain, I would suggest, because you know if you've got two varios going and you've got two two GPSs telling you where you're you're going. Um, and and the thing that you know Andre can talk about. We'll show you some screens. Is the, beyond Vario and one or two other things that you'll get from a back channel type um, telemetry from a, from a spectrum of Futaba or whatever, the, the, the information is almost overwhelming uh, on the Albatross. There's so many screens of data you can have. And what, what will happen is when you first start doing it, you can handle a little bit of data. So you can probably handle the Vario, where you are on the course, etc um and then as you get more experience at it and actually flying the course becomes second nature in the same way as when you're learning to drive when you're first learning to drive and you know you, you after 20 minutes you're overloaded and the driving instructor says don't worry next lesson you'll get better it's the same with this you'll start off and at first you think gosh i've got so much information coming at me within six months you're thinking oh I want, I want more information i want my rate of climb and i want this and all this sort of stuff so um, there's a lot of data that you can have. So um, th th that, that's where the Albatross is fantastic. It, it, it's, it's got a lot more data than you'll get out of your sort of standard telemetry of a receiver. Okay, thank you very much. No, and, you know, we'll, we, we've got time at the end, so we can answer more of these questions in, in more detail. Shall I, um, Andy, shall I move on? Yep, go for it, yeah. Um, so just taking those three things, on the left is a... We've got the scale ship, big cavernous fuselage, and you can see installing a Raven, which is the biggest of the, the units in there, is really simple. And you can see the pipe work there that, that's on there. That's all about the, the Vario and the dynamic um, tech nozzle. In the middle, you've got an F5J plane with a Sparrow in there. You can see that's, that's fairly tight packaging, but it, it pretty much goes into most uh, modern F5J planes. And on the right there is a Valenta Chile with the receiver pack, and you can see the Sparrow. Uh, sort of fairly lost in there. So those are three sort of typical uh, setups. Greg, it's so, probably worth just saying on the um, on the F5J models, you just need to be a bit careful about canopies. Mm. <clears throat> a lot of the canopies are carbon, which the GPS won't work through. Yeah. So sometimes you have to window the canopy or something like that to get it to work or put the um, put the sparrow where there isn't carbon. Yeah. And it's where um, a lot of F5J planes may be from three or four years ago before it became really popular to have a carbon front end, which most modern F5J planes that have been sold at the moment, a lot of the pipe, pipe perfection and planes like that, they've actually got a, a Kevlar front nose, which makes that whole setup of the GPS easier than it, it is if you've got a, a very lightweight uh, F5J plane. So um, it, it actually, if you've, if you've got a, a, a three or four year old F5J plane, you might actually find your GPS setup easier in that than it is in a, in a very modern plane. Okay. Greg, just yes. while you've got those uh, um, screens up, the uh, should point out that with Sparrow, the GPS unit is inside the white box. So everything's all in one box complete. 
Yeah. On the left-hand picture where you've got the raven with all the pipework, uh, notwithstanding the fact that you've actually got a picture of the old-style aerial there, there's yep. a, a much improved aerial. The black box, just as you look at the picture above it, is the GPS unit. Yep. It's separate on the raven, um, whereas in the sparrow, it's all in the, the little white box, which is why you've got to be careful with um, carbon. Whereas with the bigger models with uh, using Raven, the GPS unit is actually on about half a metre of cable. So you can stick it somewhere away from the Raven unit itself. Okay. Let's move. Well, thank you, John. Very good point. Right, let's move on. So, um, the, so two very different styles. So you've got John in the middle and myself on the left. John flies a European tray style transmitter and I fly a jetty, which normally I'd actually fly with the straps and have it more like a tray. But for GPS flying, I fly it with an X strap. And so you can see the difference in the position. And on John's transmitter and my, my transmitter, you can see the, the snipe um, sitting at the back there receiving the data with the, the whip aerial whereas in the picture of the finch you can see it's got the small stubby aerial and then just a very preliminary glance um, on the right hand side there is a, a phone there um, which has got the moving map and some of the telemetry um, of a GPS flight but what I'll do now is we'll go on to the next slide which, and the, that is a tablet with a snipe on there and again, you can just about see the, the, the moving map in there. And, and this is a shot from Australia, so very arid. That's a scale plane. Um, so some people fly with a transmitter mounted visual and some people fly with a tablet mounted. We had a question earlier from, or a pre-question from a gentleman called Norman. And he said, well, is there an issue with having phones and things on the flight line? Um, Generally, I would say that most people, when they're doing this, these the phone and the tablet, they're in receive mode only. They're in aeroplane mode. They're not actually transmitting anything. Um, so you shouldn't have any problem with the with the interference on with them interfering with your two point four. I would say that I, you know I fly and I always forget to turn my phone when I fly on my own at the field that I fly at. I always forget to turn my phone off on the on the mountain and transmitter, and I've never had a problem. But uh, generally, I would think that. that if you're flying with other people at a field, you would you would turn the plane into air, airplane mode. Right. So, on, Andre, do you want to just talk a little bit about what you did developing the app? And you, you've done a few releases into 2020, and maybe uh, you've got anything planned for us in 2021? Just a few minutes would be really good, please. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Rick. No, thank you. Well, <laughs> welcome. Uh, my name is Andre. I come from Slovenia, Europe. Um, so the Albatross, it's basically the result of last three years of development. It's uh, basically a moving map with a lot of information with uh, online, sorry, uh, real data coming in from the Finch or Snipe units. Basically, it shows you the task where you have to fly. So one question which was asked before, uh, the answer is that you fly the course over the moving map, which is presented by the albatross. You see the sectors which you have to enter, the line which you have to cross, start, finish. And basically, you can customize everything inside the albatross. So all the colors, the, the map, turn it on or off, uh, select which now boxes with the information you would like to see on on which page you are. Basically, Albatross has uh, four pages, which you can switch with uh, manually on pressing on the screen or via servo channel from your transmitter. So basically, it has a start page where pilots are setting the parameters which they would like to see before starting the task, so they are not too high, too fast, uh, so how many penalty points they got and so on and so on. Then they have a thermal page, which is basically the information they need when they thermal, basically the average thermal, the, the altitude gain in the thermal, the time spent in the thermal um, and so on. And then they have the glide page where you have the information which you need 
when you are gliding, that means the distance outside, inside of the, the task, then the flight time, remaining time, the index of the last triangle, and so on and so on. And the, the fourth page is the info page, which is, I would say, just additional page where people put some more stuff uh, where they can find it while they need it during the flight. Um, Albert Ross was also the biggest introduction in uh, 2020 was basically an upload button, which saved a lot of problems for the pilots because in past every pilot after he landed, he had to download the flight from the onboard unit or send it from the older apps save it to the SD card and then send it to bring it to the computer and download it from the SD card and upload it to the web page, GPS triangle leak and so on. So in the Albatross, basically we have in a logbook, when you go and check your flight, just a press a button which says upload, you press it and the flight is already on the GPS triangle leak server. And hopefully in the future, GPS contest competitions will also use this GPS Triangle League server for the on-field competition. So basically, it will be the same scoring after the pilot lands. He press the upload button and that's it. So basically, no cheating, no nothing. Everything is digitally signed and so on. So that was quite a lot of work. Uh, new stuff, yeah, some new updates are coming very shortly. We are doing some um, pretty nice stuff, which I would not like to tell about because I have to test them. <laughs> but I think um, people will be overwhelmed once they see it. And what I have to say that when I presented three years ago, um, the snipe and idea of the stereo information over the headphones like 80 percent of the pilots says well we don't need that uh, because we have a helper to navigate us where to fly but at that time it was a lot of talk in the pilot box where to go how high he is and so on and so on and now more or less it's quiet because everybody just listening the tone in left or right ear flying by themselves and the navigator is basically only for spotting the other planes, doing the tactics, where is good air mass, what are others doing and not really navigating the pilot where she, he has to go. So that's it for me for now. Brilliant, thank you. Perfect, thank you. absolutely perfect. Let's see now, my, my slides are for some reason are not playing forward. Let's try this down here. Right, so that's good news, technology works. So Andre just alluded to something there, which is, um, this is a classic shot that you get if you're at the field. Um, and you can see on the right-hand side, that's like a Google map shot. And that's when you first launch the, the app on the phone and you go into flight, you'll get that. And then it's great use for locating where you want to put your course. And we can talk about that at another time if we do nothing about how that will work. So simple just to go to the field and put a course but most pilots will use the view on the left, which is you literally just touch the screen with your finger and you get the, the non-Google map type. Um, and when you're flying in bright sunlight, that, that on the left-hand side is what you get. And, and Andre alluded to the screens. And at the bottom there, you'll see there are six boxes and there are some data in there. There are a, a number of fit screens you can have with different data. You can touch any of these boxes and change the data to to the parameters that are in the app. So you don't have to have what's preset in the app. It's absolutely fantastic bit of kit. And the, the, the recent update that Andre did, um, I've flown with it quite a bit since uh, it came out and it is super fast, the refresh rate on it. So it's, it's um, it, uh, for me, having this is my first year, I have to say that I sort of feel very lucky to come along just when Andre's really commercialized it and come up with a really robust uh, product. So just um, there will be maybe some people on the um, on the, the Greg web. Yes, sorry, go on. Yeah, I would just like to uh, jump in. Of course, um, we can uh, share you the links on GPS Triangle 
uh, website. You can also find the links to my webinars, which are on YouTube. Hmm. And basically, if somebody has an interest, there it's basically three hour, one and a half hour, two times uh, webinar about Albatross, all aspects, settings, what you can do with it, and so on. So if somebody is more interested in, he can go and check all these webinars. Yeah, that's a, really, that's a really good point. And we'll talk a little bit about that at the end. So thank okay. you. It's a really good, good prompt. Thank you. Um, so there is some legacy kit out there, as John, talk, John talked about some of the stuff that's been around. Um, and I, I would say I don't know anything about it, really, because I didn't use it. I came straight in and used Albatross. But it is still possible to buy T3000s. And I don't know that there's someone on the seminar tonight, John Minchel from Shopkir. He bought some stuff, and you can use that uh, with the app. So, But if, if that's something that someone wants to do, um, and have a chat you know we're very very willing to to help you and get you going on that but uh, the legacy stuff is still okay to use if you, if you want to use it so um on to the last couple of slides and we've been going an hour so i'm, I'm very aware that we want to get onto some questions really um and i'll sh we'll stop talking and you, you guys can to prompt us um how, if you wanted to get into it i would say one of the best things you could do is come along to one of john's really excellent gps um training weekends we've got three scheduled and um, again if people are interested in the details of those we can provide those to to, to them after the the presentation they are actually up on the, the gps facebook uk facebook page which is a really good source of information and i know not everyone's on facebook and not everybody um likes facebook but that's a that is a great source of information they're also on the barks uh forum as well but as i say if people want to contact us um you know that's not a problem you know help with that um what i would say is if you come along to an event like that or you fancy buying a a gps out, you know uh, outfit from from bernie and and andre then you, you know if you've got an fij plane or an, some form of electric glider fit a gps to it and have a go with it you, you don't have to take part in the league you can start to develop your skills and get used to it and see if you, you really like it but if you attend one of the events we're going to have some we do have some units that you can install so you can bring your plane and, and fly it. Um, if we get time, we'll bring in a pilot that's just started doing some GPS triangle racing towards the end of the year, Paul Eisner, who's a control line pilot, and talk about his experiences, about how he's come along and he's met John Greenfield, come over to Phoenix, come over and flown with me. Um, and, you know, I think if that's a great way of getting into it and seeing what it's like is and the thing that i found about it is like every other discipline i've ever been in model flying people are very giving of their skills and knowledge there's no secrets people want you to enjoy it it's very addictive um and you know it, it's as i said earlier it gives a sense and purpose to your flying rather than just maybe turning up and doing some thermal soaring so any help that we can bring you know simon myself uh, john I think you'll find that the pilots are very, uh, very, sort of very, very helpful. And as I said earlier, you don't have to have a scale plane. You don't have to have a sports plane. You don't have to have a GPS light class plane. Um, you know, any sort of glider that's electric launch will will do for you to have a go. Um, and then just finally, this is so you guys can have a look. You've got the, the this is what the, the front page of the GPS Triangle League looks by, like. And what's really exciting about it is across the top there you've got the rankings and you can fly you can look at day ranking you can look at the monthly ranking or you can try and compete for the for the annual ranking um and uh, it's actually really addictive and i post my scores that in the summer on on the ranking and and literally at the end of the day i'd get on my phone and see who'd been flying that day and whether um whether they'd beaten me or i'd have beaten them and you know you can argue that people get much better lift in let's say in Berlin, where they get some fantastic scores. They seem to have very, a field where there's very, very good lift with the guys at Tenerife. But it is very, very addictive. And it's also, with where we've been with COVID, allows you to, to go and compete without actually having to be at a field of competition with people. So I think that's the sort of the end of the, the slides. And if the, the panel wants to chip in and say anything at this point, or we'll, we'll crack on with, some, with the questions. I've got a couple of questions come up. Um... They're, they're, you're answering them live, which is great on, on the type, but I just wanted to bring in a couple of them. Um, on on a, a Neil Harrison asked, on average, how many pilots attend a comp and what is the split between classes? I'll have a go at that one. Um, generally, there's uh, 
a, a split in competitions. The scale and SLS class tend to fly uh, together, although in separate heats. They're not actually flying head to head. Um, and the sport class and sometimes the light class will be flown at the same weekend, but again, not at the same time. Um, so numbers at competitions, well, that depends where it is, where you're located. Um, 20, 30 people at a competition, uh, some of the more popular ones, but it could be down to half a dozen people at a competition. Um, normally a competition is um, held over, if, it, if it's over one day, five rounds. So there's lots of flying to be had, because if you can fly out all five rounds, that'd be two and a half hours flying. And of course, when you're not flying, you'll then be paired up with somebody else and you'll be their navigator um, tactician. So it's a full on day of flying. It's not as if you're going to turn up and get two five minute flights. There's lots and lots of flying at a competition. Yeah. John, um, Phil asks as well, are, are tugs available at GPS training weekends for third scale? Um, by prior arrangement, yes. Um, not only for third scale, but anyone who's got a, a glider that actually won't self-launch. But I do need to know if you want that because I've got to arrange tug pilots. Now, fortunately, within the Ghost Squadron team, we've got lots of them. Um, so I can arrange tug pilots, but I do need to know if you need them. Brilliant. Thank you. One, one question that I'm going to just throw in here. It's one we've on, on lots of different sessions that we've had. Um, lots of people are always asking, what's the sort of what's the sort of basic startup prices or costs for, for models? Are there plenty of second-hand kit around? Uh, and, and what are the top-end models costing for interest? Right, well, to, to start in this um, sport, you the best plane to use is the plane that you're most comfortable flying. Well, I can't stress this enough. You, It's almost counterproductive to buy a high-end, high-spec, um, aeroplane. There, as, as Greg has said, there is so much information coming from the, uh, the electronics in terms of information, distance, height, speeds, inside, outside the course, distance to turn point, uh, and a multitude of other bits and pieces, that it's very easy to get brain overload and actually be so busy concentrating on all the information you'll be bombarded you forget to fly the aeroplane. Um, so a plane that is simple to fly and you're very comfortable with is the way to start. Mm. Buying an expensive hot ship um, is, I think, can be very counterproductive. You're going to be quite nervous about flying it if you've invested a lot of money, and therefore your focus is going to be on the plane and not on the information. And that's not going to help you move on. So especially at our training weekends, I make great play of it doesn't need to be an aeroplane that meets any particular class or specification. Just bring along something that's big enough to fit the kit in and that you're comfortable with flying so you can learn uh, what it's all about. Brilliant. Thank you, John. A couple, of other, a couple of other questions. I'm just sort of scouring through some of the answered questions as well. A lot of people looking for information. Um, I'm... I mean, I think what we can say is that um, the, the website that we have, uh, we'll, we'll have a load of links on there and, and um, you, you'll we'll supply be, some those. I think me, myself and Greg and John are putting together uh, an information email that we'll send out in the next couple of days with lots of links and various other bits and pieces. So that answers a, a better dozen questions because there's quite a lot yeah. about where do we find the Facebook page and, uh, and, and links yeah. to uh, Andre's um We'll send that to everybody who's system. registered. I think uh, it's probably a good opportunity. We ought to have a quick plug for next week before we go on for with further questions. We've got uh, two of our, shall we say, elder statesmen joining us, uh, Martin Dilley and Jim Wright, who are both on tonight, uh, talking about changing times in model flying and looking at the achievements over the past 100 years of the BMFA. So uh, that should be uh, very worthwhile and interesting evening. And I'm just posting the link now in the chat box if anybody wants to uh, get signed up quickly before all the spaces go. Absolutely. Um, right. Yeah. 
We've got a hand up from Bob Dickinson, so I'll, I'll bring Bob in to uh, ask his question. If you want to unmute yourself, Bob. Hello. Um, just a question that can we actually use um, receivers such as the Jetty Assist, which have a gyro function? Did you get that? Mm. No, nope. you've stopped them, Bob. You've stopped them. No, no I was waiting for uh, I was waiting for Simon or John to, yeah. to give the answer because you, you can use the Jetty much. Assist, Bob, but you have to um, disable the gyro. You're not allowed to use gyros on on this. Okay, fine. so you can you can use your assist, but you've got to disable the gyro. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Good to see you, Bob. Yes. Yeah. Anybody's got any questions? Just raise your hand, and I'll bring you in. Well, wow. well, I mean, well, the silence is definitely. Oh, hang on. The, Sorry, we didn't have one there, but I've just, <laughs> I've just hit the uh, wrong button. Uh, so we'll bring Ian in, in again. Yeah. And then we, after Ian, we have Guy Lucas. Thank, thanks, the un uh, thanks, Andy. Um, so just a sort of general question around. So, um, a bit related to the tech nozzle question I asked earlier. So obviously, if you take a fairly gentle climb to sniff around the course um, on your way up, you can fly anywhere you like. Um, and so long as you just cross the start gate, um, what sort of time are you taking to climb, John, Greg, Simon? How long are you taking to get to your 400 metres in sport? I'm a great believer that rocky type climbs um, uh, can be counterproductive. Uh, the first thing to say is in a competition, there's normally a 10 minute window um, in which you've got to launch and to get through the start line. So you've got 10 minutes to play around. So climbing at you know, 10 meters a second is a complete waste of time because you'll be up at launch height and not have had a, a sniff around the course and upwind and see what's coming. So uh, my GPS special fully ballasted climbs at about four and a half to five metres a second. And at that sort of climb rate, it's very easy to detect if you're flying through good air or bad air. And I'm a great fan of uh, assuming the site allows and there's no not any no-fly zones or anything that precludes it, to, to make the climb upwind and get a feel for what the air's like upwind uh, and if it's particularly bad air, uh, then I'll, I'll hang around and let the clock run down. Um, part of the Albatross app, you can actually set a countdown clock. Um, so there's no point in just bombing up and rushing straight in. Um, and if you do that, everybody's going to stand and watch and see what you do and see how well you're doing. And if you find a thermal, they'll all come running. If you're coming down like a brick, they'll all go around and, and, and wait to start later. The other thing to remember is that within that 10 minute window in a competition, you can restart as many times as you want. Okay, so so how, what sort of speed are you climbing at? What KPH are you climbing at, John? Well, to be honest, I've never really checked it, but probably similar to my sort of glide speed, so around about 50, 55 kilometers an hour um, to, but to be honest I don't really know I'm more interested in the climb rate and I keep an eye on the climb rate because again in the Albatross app um, you can see your, your, your rate of climb and I keep an eye on that while I'm climbing up to see what the air's like I don't pretend, really take much notice of the speed I'm climbing at to be honest the, the airspeed I'm flying at okay thank you Simon, did you want to add anything to that? Um, only that John will say I climb far too fast, and I, and I do. <laughs> and there's a slight reason for that. My, my hot ship, um, <clears throat> if I try and throttle back in the climb, the brake doesn't work, and then the prop windmills, and that's a complete disaster. So I've actually bought some smaller batteries or less, less cell batteries to, to reduce the climb rate. <clears throat> but John, John's absolutely right. You want a modest climb. You don't want it to be very, very gradual, but, but you do want a modest climb rate. So you get a chance to have a, a fly around, see what's around, um, and say use the start window to best advantage. Um, so, yeah. 
obviously the other question around that Simon is of course hot ship it to 400 meters have a stooge around at 400 meters because the lift at 400 meters is going to be markedly different to the lift at 300 meters particularly it is, yeah. um, high speed tactics I've been okay with but that's probably because I've got a long history of thermal soaring so it hasn't been too disadvantageous to me but um, I, I think the right place to start is a modest climb rate personally. Okay Ian just on that point I tend to climb um, to about 450 metres because right. um, by the time I've uh, had a bit of a sniff around I'm down to 400 uh, which not only is the start height for the sport class but it also gives me an idea of what the thermal strength is at that point. Um, if you only climb to 400, by the time you've had a bit of sniff around, you could be at 350 or 300. You're not really getting, you're not checking the, the right air mass. Yeah. So I always tend to climb a, a bit higher uh, to give me a chance to fly down through the air mass that I'm, I'm going to hopefully start it. Sure. And how challenging is it to hit? So, I mean, theoretically, the best entry for the course has got to be about 395 metres at about 119 kph because even if you're not in lift you get a ping out the back of that which yeah. gives you a, a, a but, good entry point to 350 yeah. meters to your right well i'd say when you're practicing your starts <laughs> yeah I I practice practice the start, and i reckon to get through somewhere between 390 and 400 um and uh, somewhere between 80 and 110 um kilometers an hour and I reckon I can do that pretty consistently. All right. Can we shall we bring Guy Lucas in now? His uh, hand up, bit hands up for a while. Can you Go hear ahead, me? Guy. Yeah. Can you hear me? Hi, Guy. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's sort of John will know what I mean with this question, but it's three parts. Firstly, does it matter? Can you start off with a DX18 as your main radio, and then? and you have the GPS stuff mm -hmm. with that works with that. Um, so well, the, the on, radio on, gear and the uh, the GPS kit, for want of a better word, is it distinct? Um, and so complete, yeah. completely standalone. Okay. Uh, as okay. you say, I, I fly Futaba and there's no direct link between the Futaba gear and the uh, GPS kit, other than the fact that I can actually switch the star on and off from the transmitter. But you could use any make of radio gear at all, and the GPS kit stands completely separate. Okay, so that was that was my first question. I didn't have to strong arm Bernie for a cheap let it jetty. Wouldn't uh, work, guy. <laughs> 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 my my next question. Just give me your card number and I'll send the stuff over. <laughs> Have you not got it already, Bernie? <laughs> not yet. Uh, my next question is, so, John, if I gave, put it my, or took one of these events, my YT ASK21 and fitted it with GPS equipment, that would, even though that wouldn't stay up for as long as your light models, it you could run the course and find out absolutely. and get absolutely. used to yeah. the principle of what you're talking about. Absolutely. It can't be that easy, actually. No, it is that easy. It seriously is. Um, uh, you know, just come along with the plane and we'll kit it out, especially that plane. It sounds fairly easy. Like we get, we'd be able to get the radio, the GPS into it and have a go. It doesn't, it doesn't matter if you've got a hot ship or haven't got a hot ship. The whole thing is to have a go at it. Yeah. And, and, um, as I said, I said, I said earlier, you know, it's like learning to drive. You're overwhelmed. You can be overwhelmed with the information that's available. You know, just just learn to fly down to the first turn and come back, listen to the beeps and the tones, and uh, and very very quickly you'll, you'll start to develop. And whether you do one or two legs or you do fifteen legs, it really doesn't matter. And forgive me for not listening, but so where would you go when we are all allowed to get together and talk and everything else? Where are these meets where you've got? Um, equipment that you could just give us a taste in our own aeroplane. Uh, right, I'm looking at my wall chart. The first so one, build all that into the yeah. information yeah. email we send out. We'll, we'll yeah. send a nice long yeah. one with lots of information for everybody. Yeah, on that one, right. we'd have to give you notice that we were coming, 
and we would have a certain amount of time with that and someone else would then have more time with it. Mm. But meanwhile, when we went there, we could still fly our other plane in a normal way. We wouldn't only be coming mm. for the GPS. The first one's at Buckminster. Yeah. Um, so there's plenty of space to fly there and the yeah. certain things. So, but I think you'll find that you'll get a lot of attention and you'll get a lot of flying. Um, Bernie and Andre are normally very well kitted out with with um, loan units so um it's not going to be a problem guy you'll get a lot of flying and john there'll be plenty of room in in the ask 21 to stick in your equipment absolutely yeah okay all right guy thank, thank you very much we're going to just move on we've got two more live questions and then we're going to have to call it a day we're, okay. we're shooting well we're, over with a few hands up there so next we've got ian yes sorry i struggled to unmute earlier on um it's a safety question really um bearing in mind that you're flying relatively large models well above 400 feet most of the time obviously if you've got a competition on or you're flying with someone else you've got a navigator you've got a look a lookout but if you're flying on your own and you've got the gps to concentrate on as well as the model and everything how do you assure that you've got adequate separation from any full-size traffic generally we have a spotter um first of all if you're flying um anything more than a uh, sport class model over 400 feet of course um, not only does the, uh, the, the an exemption be needed um, but a no tam as well although no tams don't the private pilots don't seem to take any notice of them but first and foremost it's your responsibility to ensure you can fly safely and if you're getting so inveigled in watching the, the the Albatross app and the model that you can't keep an eye on airspace, then you really shouldn't be doing it on your own. John, is that answer your question, Ian? Yeah, it, it does. I just want to, it's just if 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 tonight uh, tonight's broadcast actually generates a lot more interest and people start flying from their own fields and uh, you know particularly here in Lincolnshire where we get a lot of relatively low level trainee RAF pilots around mm. and so on, we do need something we do need to be aware of. That's all. So I'll just add my two penny worth to it. I, I would say I've done a lot of flying on my own uh, this year, and I've done flying with with other people helping me spotting. Um, when we when we're flying and you've got a spotter, we use an app on the phone, um, which is a tracking app for light aircraft. It's not perfect, but you they've obviously got their transponders on, so you can see them coming, and you know your spotter's looking at that and got, they've got that there. Um, I would my my view on it is if I hear a plane coming, I would immediately sort of stop trying to concentrate on uh, what I'm looking at on the screen, and I'd have, try to have a look where the where the plane is. And if I thought there was any issue with separation, I would come down to 400 feet. And uh, you know, with the GPS light planes, I don't see that as an issue. The scale planes, John's the only person in the UK that's probably really got a scale plane. There's a few other guys um, with the sports class. Yeah, they can fly at fairly high altitudes. But the other thing about them is they're incredibly strong. That they built most of them. And you can st stick the crow out or stick them into a vertical dive and get them down very, very quickly. So you know, my, my response to it, if anyone was asked me what they should do, is if you hear a plane, have a look, see where it is and get the thing that your plane down, you know, stick it in a vertical dive and get it down to, to below 400 feet. And of course, you've got the telemetry on the plane. You know where 400 feet is. Um, so, you know, you can come down and um, you can even set a warning if you want to at 400 feet in the Albatross to tell you. You just breach 400 feet. So, uh, you know, I, I, I've flown, I'm not going to say how many flights I've, I've done this year, but I've done a lot of flights. It's never been an issue uh, if you're diligent. David, would you like to unmute and ask your question? David, not there. Neil, Neil White. Yeah, um, if you're actually flying the course, you've already started flying the course, right? And say for argument's sake, you've been lose lift and you know you're not going to get all the way around and then you restart the motor. Does that mean you wouldn't be able to post the time for that run? Correct. And what you can do is you can, there's several things. You can either just touch the screen on the app and restart the, the task. So you just motor back up to whatever, if it's the sports class 400 meters and just restart the class. If, uh, if you want to, you, as Andre said, you can set a channel on your radio. So you can just literally flip a switch on the, on the transmitter and, it, and in your ear, you get a notification that says uh, task restarted. Brilliant. Right, okay. Cheers, thanks. Yeah, thank you, Neil. David, one final one. Can you unmute and ask your question? Last person today. 
No, it doesn't look like it. I think that's that's probably where we ought to call it a day. We've had a really good run, and um, yeah, we've got. We've, I think we've answered all the questions. I think you're doing them live as well. So looking at the, um, we've got one answer question. But I would say to that person, um, Stella, or give us just get in contact with us. You know, we're we're we really want you guys to to have a go at it, and um, you know, got plenty of time to answer questions offline. And we'll we'll make sure everything's on the uh, in the air tonight website for. For contact details as well so we'd like to thank everybody and um yeah again plug for next next week and um you will have a little bit of history next week so um we'll see where martin and jim take us so we'll really look forward to that and um yeah thank you all so if the panelists want to hang about for a little while for a few moments and um we'll let everybody leave the room yeah. and, uh...